But do you think my books are my books are long? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's shaking? My name's Cam. Welcome to another video. Well, uh, actually, w welcome to the first video on my brand new channel, Wolf the Story Nomad. I really hope that sounds as cool as I think it does. <laughs> I'll be doing weekly videos here talking about fantasy and horror stories. I'm talking deep dives, reviews, video essays, a whole ton of stuff. I have a lot of fun stuff planned, so I would love it if you stuck around. Uh, so. So, 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 a little while ago on my writing YouTube channel, I asked for some fantasy series recommendations. I can't really pinpoint why, but for a long while now, I've just had a really strong urge for some intense escapism. Who knows why? And I was slapped with one particular recommendation a lot more than any other. And I mean slapped. It was intense. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought I was being indoctrinated into some kind of like fantasy cult, but... <laughs> I'm easily encouraged anyway, so I said, sign me the heck up, and I picked up a copy of Way of Kings. That's right, your boy Cam Wolf has finally hitched up his big boy pants and has started reading Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive. And I hated it. No, I didn't. Obviously, it's really, it's really good. Amazing, actually. Despite the fact that the book is more dense than an after burrito dump, looking back, I'm glad that you guys slapped me with this recommendation, like the dude on Family Guy showing the other people the pictures of his kids. So I'm going to be talking about my first impressions with Way of Kings. How I interpreted or enjoyed the characters, the world, the magic, and the writing. And I would like to think that I'm not a complete uh, bunghole, so I'll leave spoilers out of it. That way you can enjoy this video whether you've read it or you haven't. Let's go! So Way of Kings takes place on the continent of Rosha, almost entirely in the Shattered Plains, a location that is constantly ravaged by battle and extreme tempests, known as the High Storm. Storms so regular and severe that they shape the landscape, the ecosystem, and even the economy. The war between the Alethi and the Parshendi takes place over a network of harsh stone chasms, chasms that can only be crossed with mobile bridges. Creatures in the Shattered Plains have evolved to weather the storms, monstrous beasts covered in shell. These chasm fiends carry an extremely precious resource, gem hearts, a commodity so valuable that it changed the face of the war and only seemed to escalate the conflict. On the surface, a location like the Shattered Plains being the setting for a story as long as Way of Kings seems pretty ambitious to me personally. Areas this bleak generally struggle to carry a story too far without losing steam. That's only a testament to Brandon Sanderson's skill though, because the danger involved with battling on and traversing these chasms and its beasts and the high storm end up being one of the most exciting elements in the entire story. I get a lot of satisfaction over how currency is handled in fantasy. It's one of my favourite things when the author tells us about a character handling coin or exchanging gold. Brandon Sanderson took that to a whole new level with Stormlight Archive in creating spheres. Glass orbs with a gem at their centre. Gems that will become infused during a high storm, giving it a glow that can be used for trade or even things as mundane as lighting. I hope it's not weird to say that these spheres gave me the same feeling as watching those oddly satisfying animations that always pop up on Facebook. There's just something so aesthetically pleasing about currency that is, essentially, precious stones encased in a ball of glass. I would love to carry a pouch of those around just for me to dip my hand into every now and then. Yes, I said I want a pouch of balls. Go ahead and make your jokes. Dalinar, one of the many Alethi High Princes of the Shattered Plains, may be my favourite character in the entire book. I know Kaladin is the crowd pick, and for good reason, but I've always found myself more fascinated by characters with more story behind them than ahead. Dalinar reminds me of Orin from Final Fantasy X in that way. He's an aging and battle-hardened warrior, known for his blood-soaked reputation as the Blackthorn. I'm also quite drawn to weary father characters, and Dalinar finds himself struggling as he watches one son become more like himself, the very man he's losing faith in, while the other son has little faith in anything at all, least of all himself. 
Dalinar finds himself questioning his role in this brutal world, and he questions the role of the people he's cut down along the way, the countless bodies that he's left in his stride. The other soldiers and nobility believe that the Blackthorn may be losing his touch. They've seen him having violent visions during the high storms, prophetic dreams of a different age. They think it might be madness. These visions only force Dalinar to further question himself, and more importantly his honour. What is honour without faith in that which you fight for? That which your fellow men die for? I absolutely loved that we get to see this hardened warrior dealing with the genuine guilt and trauma of the desolation of war. There's a certain moment where he has a panic attack in the midst of battle, surrounded by countless Parshendi that he had cut down, and it just feels so… authentic. Dalinar and very few other high princes and nobles, including one of his sons, have what is called Shard Plate and Shard Blades, ancient relics left behind by the Knights of Radiant, unfathomably valuable and sought after. Now this is easily one of the most fun elements in the entire story. Within 10 heartbeats, anyone who has access to these items will find them materialising into existence. Monstrous swords that can cut through stone as easily as Red's foot through Eric's ass. They don't cut through flesh, but rather the person's soul. They'll render limbs useless or burn them from the inside out. The shard plate is almost indestructible and gives the wearer incredible strength, speed, and endurance. I really appreciated the fact that Brandon had these shard plates and shard blades come into existence after 10 heartbeats rather than 10 seconds, which is a direction that I think a lot of other authors would have taken this. Having this mechanic depend on heartbeats really showed just how much these shard items are tied to that person. It shows that they have a toll, that they have a cost on the person's physical state, rather than just being some cheap magic gimmick. Kaladin Stormblast is the defining protagonist of this book, and in a lot of ways he is your expected hero. He's relentlessly brave, resilient, and in most cases a paragon of moral virtue. This is something that generally bores me pretty quickly, but Brendan Sanderson did something with this character that truly surprised me. Kaladin also has a companion named Syl. She is what's called a Spren albeit a rather unique one. Spren are small creatures of wind and light, drawn to different emotions, life forms, or forces of change, like fire or death. They're generally sentient, but passive, not interacting directly with humans. But Syl is different. She takes the form of a woman, and seems to know things that a Spren shouldn't. In the Stormlight Archive, the high class and the lower class are defined by a simple trait, your eyes. The light eyes are seen as nobility, as it's associated with those that wield shard items or hail from the radiance. The dark eyes, however, are dealt with as the lower class, to varying degrees of cruelty or indifference. Kaladin is a Dark Eyes, and a former soldier. He now finds himself among other condemned men, doing the single most dangerous task in the Shattered Plains. He's a bridgeman, poor souls that carry the bridges for the soldiers to cross the chasms, exposed to the elements and treated as fodder for the enemy archers. There's a good quote that I think sums up Kaladin's role in this story quite well. Kaladin was like the mouldy crust on a starving man's plate. Not the first bite, but still doomed. In your standard fantasy, we would probably see Kaladin simply rally the other bridgemen with a rousing speech or a show of bravery. But in Way of Kings, we get a bit of a spin on that. We get a bit of a different, more authentic approach. Kaladin is, in a lot of ways, like your standard fantasy hero, at least in the first book. But his rise to being a true leader, to being a true hero, starts with him being brought down to rubble. Kaladin was already an accomplished soldier and a leader in his own right, so his character arc in this story is more so one of rediscovering his potential. His honour is gone, his purpose is gone. He finds himself in a situation where he cannot simply rally these men to greatness. They're bridgemen, not soldiers. Most of their souls are broken, they're already defeated. Maybe he is too. Maybe he has no right to hope for more. It doesn't just take a hero or a leader to save these men, it takes something, someone, much more special. Admittedly, Shallan's part in the story didn't interest me quite as much when contrasted with Dalinar and Kaladin. It's not that she as a character, or even her role in the story was boring, but rather that comparing study and clumsy espionage with battle and redemption is a really hard sell. 
Shallon takes up a wardship under the renowned soulcaster Yasnir Colin. Uh, sorry, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Shallon's goal is to steal the prized artifact, or Fabrielle, that allows for complex magic, so that she may save her family from humiliation and despair. Things get more complicated when she builds a genuine relationship with the once cold and distant woman, and finds herself passionate for the studies that she's been tasked with. Shallon has to face some very literal, philosophical conundrums, such as the nature of morality and desperation, both in her lessons and her secret task. One thing I can say for Shallon's part in the story is that her lessons on nature and ethics and morality tie in really well with not just her goals and barriers, but also the goals and barriers of both Dalinar and Kaladin as well. Her story helps to really pull these three different POVs into a very nice and smooth parallel. There are a few other really quick notes about Way of Kings that I would like to fire off for you. I like the character of Wit in the few times that he popped up. He's like the kingdom's <laughs> roast master, and I feel like he's gonna have a lot more importance going forward. I noticed that with Brendan Sanderson's writing, there are a lot of points in the story, large sections of time where not much really happens in terms of major story developments, but I found that that's when time is spent more on meticulous character development. As fantastic as the world and the story is, the characters are what make this story shine so far, at least for me personally. I expect a lot more exciting things to come from the character of Zeth. He's such a mysterious force in the story, and I feel like that's a really good contrast to all the other hyper-detailed info that we got on the other characters. There was one kind of odd moment where Kaladin was in the heat of a very intense battle, and he had a big internal monologue about how killing is wrong. I appreciate the depth and the inner turmoil there, but it did kind of stick a boot in the momentum of that action, unfortunately. It's pretty obvious after reading this book alone that the Stormlight Archive is going to be remembered fondly in the far future as a classic. It's easily the best fantasy book I've read in years, and I cannot wait to move on to the next one. I'll probably be starting the next one today. That about does it for my thoughts on Way of Kings. If you enjoy videos on fantasy and horror books, if you like deep dives, video essays, and reviews, then I really would love it if you subscribed and stuck around for the next one. Thanks so much for watching through the whole video as well, it really does mean a lot to me. Thank you. Plenty more fun stuff to come, so I'll see you in the next one. Catch ya.